a classical way to look at the effects of alcohol, uh, clinical effects, with respect to the blood level uh, are always uh, pointed out uh, by charts like this. And here we are going up from a very low level, you know, about one-fourth legal intoxication level in terms of milligrams per DL, all the way up to, you know, 20 times as much. So let's just say there's a sliding scale between uh, very uh, slightly or s threshold effects of alcohol versus the uh, lethal effects, acute lethal effects. At approximately the level of 20 milligrams per DL, or what the uh, police meter would probably call 0.2%, 0.02%, uh, the first clinically noticed uh, effect, a threshold effect, is a slight decrease in inhibitions and subjectively a mild feeling of intoxication. At the legally intoxicated level, 80 milligrams per DL or 0.08%, you have a decrease in complex cognitive functions and motor performance. And this is the level at which statistically you have a uh, tremendously more likely uh, uh, probability of being in a car accident. You double that, and now it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know you're drunk. You have slurred speech, motor incoordinations, a lot, of, a lot of things I get when I'm giving these lectures as well. Irritability, very, very poor judgment. Now you're up to about 300, and you're in very serious trouble. We're talking about coma, usually reversible, but... I think most people would tell you that the lethal level of uh, blood alcohol in terms of milligrams per DL or deciliter is about 400. You have a, a serum blood alcohol level of uh, 400 mg per DL, there's a good chance you're dead. Um, let's look at its metabolism. Here we have, uh, m there's metabolisms at three different levels in the cell. There's at the microsomal level, the cytosol level, and the peroxisomes. At the microsomal level, which is not the majority of the metabolism, the majority is at the cytosol level, we have NADPH going into NADP plus and metabolizing uh, alcohol into acetaldehyde. The same is being done at the cytosol level for most of your alcohol, 80% of it. You have ethanol being converted into acetaldehyde and in the process of this oxidation, NAD plus is giving off an NAD plus plus a proton or a hydrogen ion. The acetaldehyde can f be further oxidized in the mitochondria into acetic acid also splitting off uh, NAD into NADH plus a proton. So here we are, uh, as this is being oxidized, this is being reduced. And also at the peroxisome level through the uh, catalase, we also have the conversion of hydrogen peroxide into regular old water. So this is the chemical metabolism of alcohol. Uh, you'll see these little charts uh, very uh, uh, often talking about what your estimated body weight would be versus your uh, blood alcohol level and how many drinks. And I, I uh, encourage you to, you know, just take a look at some of these. It basically tells you how many drinks you could have before you're legally drunk, before you have some impairment, uh, depending on your body weight. You know, knowing that if you uh, weigh 200 pounds, you, you need twice as much alcohol to produce an effect than 100 pounds. And of course, all of these colored levels are in the sub-legally uh, intoxicated uh, levels. When you get to about 0.8% or 80 milligrams per DL, you're talking about legal intoxication. I think some states have uh, a little bit higher than that. Most states are uh, point, uh, zero 0.08. So I want you to remember that. I want you to remember, and because the uh, terminology and the units are always confusing, because the blood alcohol meter will be expressed as a just a regular old percent. So if that blood alcohol meter is higher than 0.08%, you know, you're going to jail. 
if uh, that would be car that would be translated directly into 80 milligrams per DL, which is our which are the levels we use mostly uh, in laboratories. Uh, I love to throw in these uh, Windmark equations because uh, they scare you at first, but they all they do is show you a couple of things: is that your concentration of alcohol in your blood is number one directly dependent on the mass of alcohol you ingested and it's inversely proportional to double you your body weight times a constant and the constant is a little bit different for males to females because there's a little bit of a difference in the way men and women metabolize alcohol but a question which is often asked is you know, how long do you have to wait for your uh, alcohol levels to go down? And I'm going to try to give you an overall uh, estimate. Uh, you drop your level of alcohol about 0.15% per hour. So if your legally intoxicated level is, let's say, five times as much, and it took you five or six or seven drinks to be legally intoxicated, Every hour that you wait, you're going to be dropping a drink. So let's just use the general principle as one drink per hour. And that's uh, the easiest way to remember it. Um, let's talk about some of the really, really bad things, classically bad effects on the body that alcohol has, especially the liver. Uh, let's talk about a spectrum of changes going from the presence of increased fat in the liver called fatty change or fatty metamorphosis or steatosis or hepatic steatosis uh, goes by a wide variety of names all the way progressing to alcoholic cirrhosis and remember uh, this is not something that has to progress the general rule is if somewhere along this spectrum alcohol is uh, withdrawn it will not progress from fatty change to alcohol hepatitis to alcoholic cirrhosis. Of course, once you get to alcoholic cirrhosis, by definition, cirrhosis is an irreversible diagnosis. So let's talk about uh, mechanisms by which alcohol produces increased fat. There's a whole wide variety of them. And then we'll talk about the inflama inflammatory changes, uh, generally called alcohol hepatitis, which um, many can progress into downright alcoholic cirrhosis. So in fatty change, uh, we have increased fat in over 90% uh, of binge drinkers as well as chronic drinkers. Of course, you know, fat is also uh, increased in the liver with diabetes and obesity, but alcohol is one of the other three big common causes. Uh, because th the fat is increased, the liver is generally enlarged. The patient is usually asymptomatic. There uh, may be minimal or zero increase in enzyme changes as well. And this, uh, when the globules of fat become larger than the liver cells themselves, that's called macrosteatosis. If it doesn't have inflammation, it's just fatty change. Even if there's a tremendous amount of liver, even if a half or two-thirds of your liver is fat, if there's no inflammation or necrosis, that's just fatty change. Once you have inflammatory changes, this is alcoholic hepatitis. Only about, oh, 10% of alcoholics that have fatty in the fat in the liver will develop alcoholic hepatitis. Now you have significant uh, enzyme elevations rather than mild or none. Now you have jaundice, perhaps. Now you have necrosis. You'll have little substances which we'll see called Mallory bodies. And it may, a good number of these may progress to cirrhosis. And cirrhosis has its own specific definition and appearance, and we'll talk about that as well. So let's uh, get into it in the next uh, clip. Thank you very much.